All right, welcome back. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Our next speaker is Mishu Raman. He is head of cybersecurity at BNP Paribas. Please join me in welcoming him to our virtual stage. Welcome, Mishu. Hey, Daniel. See you. How are you doing today? Doing well. How about you? I'm doing excellent. Yeah, we're very happy to be here. The Cyber Summit is underway, and I know our attendees are excited to learn from you. So without any further ado, we can go ahead and jump in. So to start, could you introduce yourself and your role for anyone who's watching the session? Of course. So I am head of cyber strategy for a global top 10 financial juggernaut. Uh, operations in about 72 countries. I have a diverse team geographically dispersed. I am responsible for the Americas. So that's North and South American operations for BNP Pariva and uh, responsible for aligning to our global business, uh, UK, Asia, uh, Middle East, as well as our mothership headquarter in Paris, which keeps things interesting. Functionally, I'm responsible for vulnerability and uh, risk assessment remediation, including incident response, uh, transformation, that's where the AI piece comes in, as well as cyber operational excellence, and of course, board engagement. Excellent. Well, you must be staying up at all hours of the day and night, clearly managing the <laughs> worldwide operation. Um, thank you so much for being here. So everyone knows that AI is very helpful for, uh, for cybersecurity, but actually getting from point A to Z can be very difficult. I was wondering if you could tell us why this process is so hard in your opinion. No, that's an excellent question. And I would, I would mark it similar to uh, any other large technology transformation. So the reason I've seen it being hard, not just in financial services, but across industry is not knowing where to start and not treating it like any uh, medium to large type transformation. If you think of uh, cybersecurity, even 10 years ago, you had that bolt on mindset on, you, we need to do cybersecurity, let's just put it on top of what we're doing. So a lot of organizations, medium, small, large, is taking a similar mindset approach to say, you know what, AI is hot. It's been out there the last couple of years. We need to do it. We've been to enough conferences. Let's just put AI on top of how things, that's not how it works, right? So the challenge and why this is hard is not thinking through the due diligence of the integration, the orchestration, the intricacies that they take, whether you're doing an AI for AI sake, not cybersecurity use case, or going to the cloud is the same. You've got to treat it as a major transformation. So I think that's why it's become so hard is just folks underestimating and not treating it like a significant transformation within the enterprise. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And just to follow up on that, so I know you said you're responsible for many different things, not just the transformation portion. So how do you balance the priority of you know, AI transformation versus your other focus areas and responsibilities? No, spot on. Uh, so this AI cyber you know, integration is one of those transformation tangents, right? So on a given day, any exec, CIO, CISO, CDO has to balance the transformation piece and the operational piece. And the way, and, and it helps that I have multiple hats is I can better advocate and make a business case for the transformation because I'm seeing the operational needs of where AI for cybersecurity fits in. And the same applies in a lot of cases, may, not everybody may have the same hats as I do, but really tackling into the operational challenges and seeing what capabilities exist on the AI space to help on the RPA side or machine learning side to help make that marrying up. Excellent. Thank you. To get into specific approaches and strategies and ideas, what is in your AI for cybersecurity playbook? Uh, playbook. So I have a standard, a standard uh, overall roadmap slash transformation playbook, and it's basically starts with keeping up with the capabilities, uh, continuously benchmarking, not just because hey I want to do this particular project with AI, but continuously benchmarking myself, my organization, socializing the maturity where we are, where we're not, with IT, with the business, with the C-suite stakeholders on a regular basis. Because that helps kind of socialize and build a shared understanding on where you are as an organization, where you are in terms of maturity, what you need this year, what you need three years from now, then finding the right engagement points or pivot points 
on marrying new technology like machine learning within that space. So it's not a, a, a ad hoc, a static thing, but a continuous basis of benchmarking where we are at this given time, socializing with the pool, socializing with the CFO, socializing with the end users in the business, then looking at the capabilities that exist or emerging in the market, such as machine learning, and continuously building up on where we have engagement points of ingesting some of the capabilities. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, if you would tell me, how do you typically find the right partner companies and work with them effectively during, you know, all these efforts that you're going through? No, it's, it's hard to go at it alone and it's not sustainable. So key partners are absolutely necessary, especially from a sustainability perspective. So what I mentioned earlier about having that continuous game plan on where you want to go, what tech can you potentially ingest within that environment to use? That's where the partners comes in. So it starts with a, a thorough gap analysis on what you could do in-house from a key function, key capability, key use case perspective, and what you need help with from external partner perspective. So the due diligence is absolutely necessary, but also being transparent with the partner to really make the partnership effective on what are the dependencies? What are the uh, starting points to be able to integrate a partner solution within the environment? Got it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then, so it sounds like you know it's really important to begin with business problems or, or at least specific you know focus areas and use cases in mind, so you're not just starting with the AI kind of thing like you mentioned. Um, so, how do you actually prioritize different potential use cases for AI? Starts with ROI. So you, you can't really see business with that return on investment. So you've got to take a business lens to it, not just technology, not just cyber lens to it, to figure out which solution, which partnership, which transformation is the biggest bang for the buck. So there's a lot of uh, decision tree approach to this. So what can you do now versus later? What are the low hanging fruits? For example, from a SOC perspective, uh, tier one alert triage versus tier two versus tier three from a use case from priority uh, detection versus prevention and leveraging machine learning or AI in use case. So it comes down to what I alluded to earlier is having a roadmap for the use cases, so having a list, not just one, then assessing the value, the business value or the operational value, then adding a time element to that journey on what you want to go after in the next three months, six months, and even three years from now. I see. And, you know, maybe this is uh, too hairy of a question, but when it comes to assessing the ROI potential for a certain project, I mean, is there any formula or approach that you especially view as valuable or it does it depend entirely on the situation? No, absolutely. A common theme you'll see with the business heads, with the CEO and the CFO always is impact. So, either speed or agility, right? So in terms of how we're operating cybersecurity within the environment, either from a speed perspective, can AI make a dent in that speed, whether it's incident response or detection or automation in between the different SOC operators. So that's one area now to hone in to make that uh, propelling business case to the C-suite is speed. Second is effectiveness, right? So cybersecurity and AI, a lot of it is coverage. How do you expand coverage where a human may not be able to do in time or efficiently? So it usually comes down to some form of either speed or agility that you're driving as a result of that investment in ROI or the overall effectiveness. Either I had better coverage or I had more automated solution where it may be an analyst to do it manually. I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's funny, you know, is there any low hanging fruit that you especially feel is a great starting point for someone who might be in the audience and thinking to themselves, okay, I'm doing my ROI assessments. I think I know where I'm headed, but you know, what would Mishu say I should be paying attention to that I might not see? I mean, I know you mentioned a couple of ones earlier, but anything top of mind, low hanging fruit. So tier, tier one alerts for the SOC or security operation center, different folks call it different things, command center. So tier one alerts, we're eliminating a lot of false positive that eats up a lot of resources. And not just eats up resources, but even from a mindset, uh, capacity perspective, it burns people out. Because imagine day to day, hundreds, thousands of false alerts, uh, analysts are going through just eliminating. So meaning things that we shouldn't have to look at in the first place, usually is a good starting point to see, okay, 
can we apply AI in that use case, eliminate 70% of noise? So the actual humans give attention to the 20% or even less than that as you fine tune your machine learning algorithms over time. Yeah, it's funny. That's been a real theme of uh, the conference so far. People are really focusing in on the low hanging fruit is oftentimes eliminating the false positive um, alerts, which has been very interesting. You know, another thing that's been coming up a lot has been um, zero trust. And that seems to be at the top of a lot of people's mind. I know we didn't say we we're going to talk about this. Do you have any thoughts on that for someone who might be listening in? Um, any ideas about that? Have you been thinking about it? Yes, I've been thinking about it for about seven years. Seven years. <laughs> seven years. All right. I don't I've know why. Involved. All of a sudden, everyone's, everyone's yeah, talking I've been, about I've been it. I've been involved in a couple of industry partnership uh, piloting and testing in my prior roles as well uh, within the government. Uh, so zero trust, in essence, it, it's not a, uh, it's not whether or if. It, it is inevitable. It's how quickly can you jump on the zero trust roadmap to be able to execute things efficiently. That's where the really the discussion today is. So it is not a thing that you just do. It is your network segmentation. It is leveraging AI to do a heuristic analysis for end user behavior, right? Am I as an end user doing something odd that I wouldn't uh, maybe logging in 6 p.m. on a Sunday from uh, another country that I normally don't? So, so there are no different use cases. And a lot of it is embedded in machine learning, interestingly enough, towards your trust is how do you get that efficiency? How do you get that speed? How do you get that overall coverage that you want for the concept of zero trust that cannot be accomplished manually or by itself alone? Got it. Yeah, thank you so much for your response. <clears throat> so shifting gears slightly. So you've talked about various use cases for AI and cybersecurity. Um, what risks are there when it comes to AI for cybersecurity and how do you think about managing those risks typically? Um, so at a high level, I would say one, overestimating the value of the use case in isolation. And I want to highlight isolation. There is a value. What do I mean by that is, look, the human's still in the picture. <laughs> even, if it, even in the case of machine learning, as you probably know in the audience know, there's a lot of uh, upstream effort, uh, the, the training time, the fine tuning time. So it's about really managing expectation that knowing that uh, at least in the initial stages is augmenting, right? Not ready to quite replace the human yet from a decision-making perspective. So overestimating the value in isolation is a risk that I've seen. So it's really early on managing the expectation. Um, second is underestimating the effort, which is a which is a risk in delivery, risk in really materializing the benefits of AI that's evident. So lots of readiness. So forget cybersecurity. If you think of any AI project, a big dependency is your data readiness. Do you have clean data? Do you have accessible, credible data? Do you have uh, achievable data? Even if you build the algorithm, be it cybersecurity or anything, it doesn't matter. It could be uh, looking at marketing. So all that upfront work, the integration, the orchestration is key and is a risk a lot of organizations run into for AI projects. So not thinking that it's just plug and play. I've seen a demo for a tool. I'm gonna just throw it in my environment now. It's how is that going to orchestrate what dependencies do you have? What data that needs to be readily available to train that machine so it can actually deliver the numbers you saw in the demo? Those are the two different risks I've seen. And I think I talked about uh, expectations, right? We talked about earlier, why is it so hard? It's just not thinking through, uh, not just for AI and cybersecurity, but generally for large transformation. It's thinking through, what am I trying to accomplish? What are my priority use cases? What's my ROI? Then what is it gonna take to partner with an industry partner or even internally organization to deploy this. Thinking through that, I'm not saying you have to know A to Z 100% before you do anything that is not agile, but you have to put some thought to say, what are the risks? So one is my technical integration. Second is my readiness on my dependencies, such as data. Third is just managing expectations. Those are the three major risk areas I've seen quite common. Excellent. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. A couple follow-up questions here for you. So. You know, when it comes to someone thinking through this and thinking, you know, months down the line, trying to figure out the ROI and prioritize and be thoughtful here, um, you know, you and your position have a lot of experience with this as head of cyber strategy. Is there any uh, idea of what sort of timeline someone who's initiating one of these projects might be, might, you know, what sort of time horizon they might, they ought to think about 
for a new AI project, whether it's low hanging fruit or a more advanced project, what would make sense for them to think about in terms of timeline um, and any other sort of factors that you know they should consider? Well, that's a good question. So that one, I hate to say this, it depends. <laughs> it, depends all the best. <laughs> on the, on, it depends on the organizational readiness as well as uh, the funding model, right? So some organizations you have a dedicated uh, innovation or transformation budget, right? So say 10%, 20%. So you're not worried about money. You're thinking about, okay, let's do, do some demo. Let's look at some integration, proof of concept, throw something in, learn from it and fine tune. So you can move much faster. I'm saying a three months timeline here in that case. In some cases, particularly in the audience, they're maybe coming from medium to large organization. Then you need to think about maybe three to six months or longer because what I meant is the data, right? So if you want to train the data, you have the right logs. Are you collecting the right logs? Do you have the right telemetry data to begin with to pinpoint if you, you know, pull in a industry partner, or if it takes time to create those processes, to create those logs into the sim, so you can plug it into the AI. That requires business process changes. That requires stakeholder buy-in. That requires winning a lot of minds over, and in some cases, even cultural change, right? So that's why I mean it depends is. So that you're looking a little bit longer, I would say six months, uh, maybe a little bit longer, depending on the scale of the organization, like a global global organization. Excellent. Yeah, I know that was uh, <laughs> way too open a question. Anyway, one last thing to do uh, before we jump off here, Mishu, and thank you so much again. So you said earlier, um, you know, I think you used the word yet when describing humans involvement. You said, you know, at this time, people are still heavily involved in AI use cases for cybersecurity. Human in the loop is still very much a present theme. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about a more advanced use case of AI for cybersecurity that you're aware of, that you've seen somewhere. Um, and if you believe that down the road, there might be a path forward to having humans let it happen fully autonomous, autonomously or mostly autonomously. You know, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I think the audience is well uh, aware of the geopolitical tension uh, that exists out there and the impact of cybersecurity. Um, there are a lot of uh, references and alleged attacks coming out of that region just because of what's going on, right? So what that means is uh, cybersecurity and AI is not just for an operational thing. It, it is going to be and is already becoming a mechanism of warfare, global warfare. So that itself is going to lead advancement, not just in corporations like the audience, but in national security, in government. That's where I'm coming from. So yes, it is inevitable where you will have from descriptive to predictive. So right now, a lot of the use cases are more advanced for companies is predictive analytics, leveraging AI, looking at techniques or TTPs, I say MITRE attack framework to say, does X, Y, and Z equal to one bad guy? If so, well, what is the next step and how do I stop that guy? Two more prescriptive analytics of AI use cases where once, you know, through clustering uh, or bucketing, you realize that multiple IOCs relate back to one particular threat actor, then the AI should be able to just stop executing the next step as it predicts to be the next logical step. So I think we're not quite there yet, but yes, I do believe it is a matter of time until we make the shift from just predictive analytics for AI cyber use cases in identifying the next step, it's actually just stopping it automatically faster than a human can get to that decision point. I see. Well, yeah, thank you for saying all that. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. That was a really wonderful conversation. Mishu, thank you so much for being here. It was truly a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Patrick, are you still with us? There you are. Of course, this has been incredible. I know this virtual audience is going wild with a huge amount of virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you both. This was an amazing conversation and we really appreciate these incredible insights. And for the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our awesome exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around.